Hello and welcome to this DC Velocity webcast, Risk Management in a Post-COVID World, Building a Complex Adaptive System with Automation and AI. Hi, I'm David Maloney. I'm the Editorial Director at DC Velocity. Thanks for joining us. COVID-19 has greatly accelerated challenges in a very short time, including dramatic fluctuations in consumer behavior and rapid operational changes, both to meet demand and to ensure safety of site staff. While we don't know how long these changes will last or what the long-term impact will be, history shows us that the next Black Swan event is just around the corner. And it's not the oldest or largest organizations who survive, but the most adaptive. It is necessary for companies to build robustness into their networks to become a complex adaptive system. So today we'll discuss new tools like automation and AI, artificial intelligence, that can help build flexibility and adaptability into your workflows to mitigate risk while maintaining peak operational efficiency in times of shifting demands. Our webinar today is presented by Vecna Robotics. The mission of Vecna Robotics is customer-driven, with an objective to revolutionize customer productivity by delivering the best automation technologies. When human-machine workflows can easily adapt to ever-changing environments and demands, Vecna Robotics creates an ongoing improvement cycle that yields substantial and sustained value for its customers. For more information on Vecna Robotics solutions and success stories, visit VecnaRobotics.com. Now let's get on with our program. I'd like to introduce today's presenters. And you see their smiling faces uh, on the screen. David Clear is our first gentleman. He's the Chief Revenue Officer at Vecna Robotics. David, can you tell us a little bit about what you do and your company? Uh, yeah, my name is David Clear. I'm Chief Revenue Officer here at Vecna Robotics. Um, at Vecna, we offer a fleet of um, autonomous um, uh, autonomous mobile robots uh, for the logistics and supply chain industry, and then a range of supporting tools uh, to ensure that they are um, that th that they operate and continue to improve uh, and adapt to our uh, customers' environments. Thank you, David. Our next guest is Andy Johnston. He's the Director of Innovation at Geodis. Hello, Andy. Can you tell us a bit about yourself and your company? Sure. Thank you. And thanks to Vecna for uh, inviting us to be a part of this. Glad to do it. Uh, I'm, I oversee innovation uh, implementations, pilot programs, um, vendor research for Geodis for the Americas region, which includes the United States, Latin America, and Canada. Uh, Geodis is a third-party pro logistics provider, so we provide uh, logistics services, both warehousing, transportation, uh, and freight forwarding uh, for our customers. Thank you, Andy. Also from Geodis is Alan McDonald. He's the Vice President of Continuous Improvement. Welcome, Alan. Can you share a little bit about your company and your role there? Sure, thanks. Uh, I'd also like to uh, echo what Andy said. I, I'd like to thank Vecna uh, for hosting us on this. Um, I'll, uh, I'll spare you the details on Geodis. Uh, it's the same company that Andy works for, but my role is Vice President of Continuous Improvement. I have responsibility for the engineering and re-engineering of uh, our facilities um, across North and South America. Um, so that involves uh, everything from, from multi-client facilities to uh, facilities that are dedicated to single clients. Thank you, Alan. Our next guest is Ash Sharma. He's the Senior Research Director for Robotics and Warehouse Automation at Interact Analysis. Welcome, Ash. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your company? Sure. Thank you very much for having me on this webinar. So my name's Ash Sharma. I'm a Senior Research Director at Interact Analysis. We are a market research and business intelligence company focused on supply chain automation. Uh, and we are really passionate about helping our clients gain that competitive edge in the um, in the industry. Um, I've got about 20 years experience in tech research and my focus is heavily around robotics and automation. Thank you, Ash. And John Santigate is Vice President Robotics at Corver Supply Chain. John, can you tell us a bit about your company and your role there? Certainly, and uh, thank you for, for having me here. Great to be a part of this uh, excellent panel with a lot of folks that know a whole lot about this topic. Um, so as the Vice President uh, of Robotics at Kerber, I lead the effort here to uh, develop and execute to a autonomous mobile robotics strategy for our customers. Kerber Supply Chain is a 
a comprehensive um, supply chain execution company. We provide customers with uh, all the software as well as many of the hardware elements that are required to run their supply chain uh, execution elements, including warehouse management software, warehouse execution, uh, a variety of robotic technologies, uh, other forms of automation, as well as packaging together the uh, advisory and delivery services that go with that. And so uh, my role here is primarily to you know build out a portfolio of channel partners in the uh, autonomous mobile robotic space and build out the business strategy to help our customers uh, take advantage of that technology area. Very good. Thank you, John. As you can see, we've got a lot of good collective wisdom on this phone call. And uh, so let's get right into some topics that we think we should address with this esteemed panel. We'll see questions pop up on the screen, but we'll be asking individual people as well as other parts of the uh, others on the panel will be chiming in with their responses as well. So for this first question, um, David, can you explain what a complex adaptive system is? What is it? Sure. Uh, yeah, I can certainly give it a go. Um, so a complex adaptive system would be a system that has uh, multiple interconnected agents um, on, uh, you know, inputs and outputs uh, that are very tightly coupled. Um, so the, inter the, the, the interaction between the various tools um, can, in many instances, lead to, uh, you know, overall system efficiency, but also if there's any challenges along the way, you can see some fairly rapidly cascading effects that can cause problems throughout an entire network. So the benefits of efficiency, um, they can, in certain circumstances, uh, you know, when, when you have challenging situations, um, you can certainly see those kind of cascading effects that cause wider challenges uh, throughout a network as a whole. Now, I think the key word here is adaptive system. So can you give us some examples of a complex adaptive system and what makes them stand out from other complex systems? Yeah, I mean, we've seen certainly, um, you know, modern supply chains uh, would certainly, uh, you know, kind of meet the definition of complex systems. And those, those, uh, th th those systems that are, that are designed with adaptability and flexibility in mind, um, you know, they have uh, certainly a higher benefit when faced with some of the challenges that we've seen, particularly in recent times with the impacts of the, the, the pandemic. So systems that have been designed explicitly for efficiency and they don't have a lot of uh, flexibility or adaptability within, um, built into the system, they can really struggle when you see some of these, these types of impacts. Um, whereas uh, organizations have designed with adaptability um, as, 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 uh, as, a, as a core competency within that system and um, have the ability to change and adjust in real time. And, you know, we see that in terms of day-to-day -day operations and be, you know, daily and weekly um, uh, surges within, within supply chains, uh, seasonal peaks that we see over the holiday window. And then obviously this year when we have what, you know, would be deemed a kind of a black swan event with the impact of, of uh, the, uh, the pandemic on uh, the, the supply chain as a whole. Great. Thank you, David. Let me turn to Ash Sharma. With your experience as a senior research director for robotics and warehouse automation, um, what has been your experience in working with complex adaptive systems? Um, I, think, I think it's clear that um, what customers are looking for or what they're needing more and more is the ability to change and have systems that adapt to their environment you know, things are changing so quickly right now, uh, and even before the situation with COVID, that um, companies were looking for uh, systems that were flexible enough uh, to change with their business. And I think that that is ever more uh, important right now, that sort of flexibility and adaptability. Thank you. Alan, do you have anything to add on the complex adaptive system model and the benefits of it? Yeah, I'll, uh, 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 I guess, echo what, uh, what, what uh, the two previous uh, gentlemen said, but really uh, it used to be a battle between uh, designing a, tech, uh, a technology into your system for maximum throughput and flexibility. So um, it, it was much more difficult uh, in the past to design for both of those. I think it's becoming a lot easier now, but uh, it does take some forethought um, to, uh, to kind of determine 
what flexibility you need and what level you uh, you're willing to accept um, uh, versus designing for maximum throughput. So, Alan, as your role as a um, let me change the slide here too, in your role as VP of Continuous Improvement for Geodis, how do you actually build that kind of a system that, like David and Ash have <laughs> previously described? Um, well, it, that's changed. Uh, it used to be. Uh, you like as I mentioned before, you you kind of had this battle between maximum efficiency, uh, maximum throughput, and flexibility. So if you wanted flexibility, you would design a much more manual solution so that you could throw labor at it. Um, the situation we're in now, and even prior to the pandemic, we're in a very tight labor market. Um, so fortunately, between uh, that and and even now, when unemployment unemployment in the U.S. is uh, approaching eight percent, but uh, you know, which which is higher than it was, but still a very tight labor market. Um, in a, in a situation like that, um, you you really need to leverage the tools that you have um, to and the technology. Fortunately, the technology is 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 coming along quickly, but you really need to leverage the technology to retain the folks that you have and. Uh, make it a more enjoyable experience for them and maximize their productivity um, and really enable them to do multiple different tasks inside the facility. So instead of just throwing labor at something, you can design a solution that uh, can allow the same operator without leaving the aisle to perhaps do a pick and do a put away. Um, and the, the product gets delivered to them um, and they they can then, without having all the travel distance or going back to get more work, they can accommodate both of those tasks. It just makes it a much more efficient uh, workplace for them, um, and it it uh, reduces reduces the risk for us, but uh, definitely enhances their productivity. Thank you. Can, you can I chime about, in? Yes, please. Please do. Yeah, you know. When I when I think about that, um, you know, I I like to think about adaptability and flexibility as similar but somewhat different, right? What is the ability to adapt to significant change and evolve business processes over time for ongoing uh, operational value versus flexibility to adapt to minor changes? For example, and I guess you wouldn't call it minor in most instances, but but peak. Right, where many organizations that we work with today are, and I know Geodis is probably facing that right now, coming into peak fulfillment season and really staffing up and teching up uh, in the modern environment. And I think they really, you know, if you think about them in two different aspects, they do, they're doing the same thing over different time horizons, where, you know, the ability to adapt to what the future is going to bring versus the ability to flex to the current state uh, requirements of the operation. Yeah, this is Alan. I, I would agree with that, John. Um, even to the extent that our our uh, consumer base, um, the end end consumer in the uh, definitely in the U.S. but worldwide is changing their habits, um, and they are expecting things more quickly and uh, expecting to be able to to cancel their order at a later time and things like that. So it does it definitely. Uh, changes the time scale to a to a much shorter, uh, smaller time scale that we need to change it. Yeah. You had mentioned about the effects of obviously the pandemic and it's and it's affected every area. One thing that we've noticed here at DC Velocity is that a lot of the digitization pro projects that people had on and you know the adapting and being flexible, uh, gaining more flexibility, and the kinds of things that you get from moving to that kind of a program that many of those that they had scheduled to do over the next few years have greatly been accelerated. Are you noticing that, and is this a way of being able to respond to some of those demands that you've just talked about? Whoever would like to yes. chime in on that. Uh, I, this is Alan, I will. This is, we are definitely seeing that. Um, it is, uh, it's, in fact, it's becoming a requirement. Um, it, it was, uh, prior to the pandemic, it was more of a decision that we were trying to balance when we wanted to do it, but it's uh, it's rapidly become a requirement for us to uh, to put ourselves in that situation. Yeah, this yeah, is David. Uh, uh, 
Go Sorry, ahead. John, I'll go ahead. Um, so, yeah, I would say from the vendor side of the equation, we've definitely seen that change. And, um, you know, we've had um, we've had a lot more kind of uh, inbound inquiries from companies who were a lot earlier on in their, their automation strategies. And they've certainly identified the need to have these capabilities within their network, uh, you know, moving from that kind of that, 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 that nice to have uh, uh, type of approach to it being a, a, a core and basic requirement moving forward for them for them to continue to offer the uh, you know the same level of service and to adjust to what, whatever those those changing consumer um, consumer demands are. Yeah, we certainly haven't yeah. seen demand and from consumers change any that you know the even though we're in a pandemic period that you know goods and services more is being shipped online more is is coming directly to consumer. But those demands that they've always had, and especially the, 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 the ways that we've been trained to, to expect products very quickly and on time and accurate, those have only accelerated through this time period. And it's uh, certainly difficult for companies to keep up, but the only way you can do that is by moving with this kind of technology. So, so uh, David, you know, one thing that uh, that I noticed, I've, I've got the, the benefit of working in, uh, in an organization that services a variety of industries. Right with our WMS products, we're we're selling to 3PL companies, we're selling to retailers, we're selling to e-commerce, we're selling to manufacturing environments, and so forth. And one thing we've seen is, you know, almost a dichotomy of of circumstances where industries that were heavily reliant on you know in-store customers uh, were have scaled back some of those investments, while we've seen tremendous increases in those that were either already in the e-commerce space or scaling up to adapt, uh, as we're talking about, to the environment that we're facing today. It, it's really a circumstance that we're seeing the investment perspective uh, around technology being driven by, uh, in part, the industry and the current state of uh, what's going on in the world, as well as looking out towards where the growth opportunities are. And I think we all see you know, the, the e-commerce space just, what was it, Q3 was 44% higher in e-commerce volume than it was a year ago. And we've seen year-over-year -year increases from 13% of, of retail to 14% this year. I think we're looking at like 19% of, of uh, retail over the year has been e-commerce. And a lot of that has been concentrated in the tail, tail end of Q2 throughout Q3. And, you know, I don't see anything slowing that down. So more so, I think there would likely be uh, continued investment in the retail sector as it adapts towards e-commerce and the growth in e-commerce. Very good. Thank you. This kind of segues into the next question and uh, looking at how organizations change and are adapting to the times that we're in. And um, Ash, you were an analyst for, you are an analyst for Interact Analysis. And John, you formerly worked for IDC. Um, so you both have had a focus on the robotics industry. How are you seeing organizations change and adapt to the times that we're in? And how are you seeing robotics companies change and adapt to service customers and survive? Um, Ash, what is your take on that? Yeah, I mean, uh, if we look at the customers first, and you think pretty much every industry imaginable has been turned on its head by COVID-19. Everything has changed in every industry. There's no, no single industry that has escaped from this, and some have seen positive impacts, some have seen negative impacts. Um, but we talked a bit about e-commerce there um, and how much it's accelerated, and obviously some of that will fall back as, as customers go back to shopping routines, but a lot of it will still be there. And Customers are talking about their e-commerce having gone forward five years overnight. Um, what they're expecting to do in 2023, 2024 is happening now. And as a result, their automation plans are somewhat outdated and they're having to accelerate those. Um, in the short term, they can try to solve it by throwing more and more labor at it, but that's obviously not sustainable and they know it. Um, and And, these customers are, are working on the assumption, many of them are working on the assumption that this pandemic, you know, may go away next year, but there are certainly possibilities for similar events happening in future. And it has shown how, um, how much risk there is in, in these connected supply chains um, around the world and how they can be uh, very, you know, to totally decimated by um, breaks in, in, in human labor and so on. 
And then on the other hand, you've seen obviously robotics automation companies try to help solve the problem. Uh, we've seen many of them scaling up and uh, fundraising and so on. And then how, trying to support customers with um, things like remote deployment or remote commissioning of, of uh, robotic systems and so on. Uh, trying to roll out new algorithms to even help with social distancing requirements within, within fair, uh, warehouses and facilities. Um, so uh, there's a there's a lot of change happening there, um, and there'll, there'll be plenty more. Very good, John. What's your take on it? As where we are with the robotics industry and trying to address the difficulties of the pandemic and the times that we live in. Yeah, I, I think Ash, that those were uh, those were a lot of great points. Um, you know, when you think when I think about industry and how organizations are adapting, I, I guess I. I jumped the gun a little bit in looking at, you know, industries have to evolve differently based on, you know, where they're where they're focused and what the challenges are that they are seeing, right? The challenges are going to be different depending on what sector you're in. Retailers, uh, you know, especially those that were largely brick and mortar centric, really have to adapt uh, really fast. Uh, those companies, because they they don't have the consumer demand walking into the store that they that they used to have, and we had seen a period of slow decline in retail sales uh, with a slow increase in e-commerce, and that's changed drastically. Um, from an e-commerce perspective, obviously, you know, tremendous amounts of more demand on those systems. And so you're looking at organizations that really need to think about how they scale. So the challenges are you know, both related to demand from a retail and e-com perspective, and I'll zero in on those two industries because I think they're the most um, significant in facing in how we adapt to COVID. Um, you know, and, and they're both adapting differently. And so with uh, with a retail perspective, again, it's about how do we get better at, at providing e-commerce related services and, and adapt our go to market strategy uh, from an e-commerce perspective. I think, Alan, you talked about this a moment ago, labor constraint uh, that hasn't gone away. Um, organizations were already making investments into, you know, flexible automation type of systems with autonomous mobile robots to adapt to uh, a labor constraint, but what's happened is there's now a bigger pool of labor available, but that's only going to be available for a very short time. When the, when the pandemic goes away and incentives go away for, for certain folks to go back to work, there's going to be a very limited window of workers that are, you know, going back to look for work and, and will take roles. But I think very quickly, you know, in the state of the economy that we are in, it turns back to full throttle uh, rather quickly, and we start to get back to that um, normalized state of, of unemployment that we've become accustomed to. And so those companies that are seeing the increased demand today really need to make the investments in technology to allow the tool sets to create a more efficient human operator in their environments to rely less, to continue to rely less upon hands touching, pro hands moving material and more, spending more time touching products. Um, and so, you know, that's where I really think there's big opportunity for autonomous mobile robotic technologies to add value, to really drive towards that non, it's the same story it's been, uh, you know, eliminate the non-value added movement of material. I think the impact and the um, urgency is a little bit more significant today. Um, from the robotic vendors perspective, right, you, you've got organizations that are seeing, you know, the same things we're seeing. They're seeing the growth, they're seeing increases in demand, and it's coming at a perfect time. You know, I, I had predicted 2020 to be a year of rapid growth in this industry uh, a while ago, and I, I think the, the COVID pandemic has just accelerated that demand in the right industries, in the industries that were already, uh, you know, not dipping their toe in the water, they might have been up to their ankle. Uh, now they're now it's a full dive into flexible automation for scale because it's out of necessity, um, and so the robotics vendors are looking at uh, several elements as I see it. Right, one is scale. How do we scale up our operation to support this increase in demand? Right, because they're facing the same labor-related challenges that the rest of the world is facing. You've got a limited labor pool with understanding of supply chains, understanding of warehousing, and understanding of robotics, a very limited pool. So by and large, those organizations are training up the next generation of talent for them. And then that creates risk because then those guys have you know a burgeoning industry to go around to. Uh, but they're also looking at their business models. 
and evolving from you know automation, which is te- has traditionally been a cap- capital expenditure, to delivering this sort of uh, technology as a service and enabling the customers to scale and flex on demand, uh, which is certainly required in today's environment that's seeking more and more seasonal peaks. Well said. Um, I think it's interesting also to note that you know if this pandemic had happened 10 years ago, we would not see the advancements that we have uh, in that in that 10 period 10 year period of time within the robotics and artificial intelligence and automation to be able to handle it. Can you speak to that a little bit too about just how far the robotics and artificial intelligence and and those industries have come along in the last couple of years to be able to to now meet the challenge that is needed to to be able to fully automate as we're seeing? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll say it's light years, right? I mean, if you look back to the, you know, the early stages of the industry, um, you know, we can all sort of pinpoint that 2012 timeframe that created a vacuum and drove innovation to, to generate these technology areas. And over the course of, you know, this eight year period, significant amounts of money and resources have gone into bringing together the physical infrastructure, the robot itself, with the artificial intelligence and the software systems that make it work and tie it into the overall business systems too, as we're talking about here, uh, really create those, you know, dynamic adaptable systems. Um, I I think it's evolved over time, uh, you know, two, three X in the course of a very short period of time, because it's not just centric to robotics. The robotic technology is building itself upon the back of autonomous driving cars as an example that you know, there's there's governments that are funding funding that development and everything that they're building for that industry is directly relatable to autonomous mobile robots just at a smaller more contained scale Very good. anyone else like to add anything yeah, that? yeah this is david i'll kind of tag on the back of that i think another area that we've seen that has helped companies like vector robotics and many others in in, in recent years is as the adoption by end users has um, ha- has increased, the feedback loop back to the development is considerably quicker uh, than it was in the past. So a lot of technology companies were founded by engineers, and you, you know we're 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 now seeing more and more of um, uh, logistics expertise that lives within those companies based on that on that rapid feedback, um, and so really moving from what maybe 10 years ago was more in the kind of science projects uh, uh, territory and um, to, you know, these are the, um, uh, companies like ourselves and, and and many others in the space, you know, are now very explicitly focused on, um, on development and uh, provision of solutions that are of value to uh, people like Andy and Alan. So, you know, uh, there, there's that, 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 that interdependency, but, uh, that that feedback loop between both sides of that equation, which is which is um, you know helping things move on very quickly, demonstrating value to uh, people like Andy and Alan, and that's obviously exactly what companies like Vecna are looking for to try and kind of move all that on quicker. Very good. Um, of course, what you're seeing isn't necessarily just um, an isolated instance of just a picking robot here or a, an AGV or something like that, but you're seeing a combination of picking robots automatic guided vehicles, machine-human interfaces, uh, autonomous mobile robots, all of these working in concert together and working with human interaction. So what does that do to the WMS? How does the role of the WMS have to change? And what kind of complementary technologies do you expect to emerge along with that? John, can you address that? Yeah, certainly. Um, you know, I'll start with a statement that I, I think when, if you look at the, the context of what happens within the, the four walls of any warehouse, you know, you really need to look at the way in which inventory is managed to create an automation strategy. There's no one solution that, that can address high, high velocity consistency, uh, you know, lumpy demand with seasonal goods and, and, you know, dock door to put away, for example. And I know, uh, many of the vendors have different uh, tools built for those scenarios, uh, but there's there's handfuls of, as you mentioned earlier, niche players that have focused on a certain aspect, and that creates a scenario where you have um, you know a, a very diverse oper- set of opportunities to deploy mobile technologies that aren't designed to operate with one another in the same floor. So, 
you know, the WMS, uh, you know, WMS vendors like Kerber have a, a, an amazing opportunity to start to look beyond just becoming the brains of the operation and extend its tentacles down into the execution level and deploy capabilities that transform from just the WMS to more WMS, WCS, WES, and that's a lot of acronyms, uh, that real, with really only the middle word being different, right? So warehouse management, warehouse control, and warehouse execution. Uh, but we are seeing more and more of the ES and CS capabilities extend upwards into the WMS as the vendors continue to realize uh, that it, it's it's not about labor management anymore in the warehouse. It's about interfacing human labor with automation and making that work from the overall brains of the operation in the WMS. And what role does the Internet of Things play with that, with being able to get data and relating that back and forth between the WMS and these other systems to create artificial intelligence to allow machine learning, some of those kinds of things? And how the, what, what's the central role that the WMS and, as you mentioned, the warehouse control system, warehouse education, execution system, how do those all play together to be able to allow for that data to be not only collected but acted upon? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll go first. Uh, we, I was already talking on this, but I think there's probably a lot of really great answers to that question here. So we want to leave some time there. Uh, you know, the IO Internet of Things is basically a collection of connected endpoints in an operation. Uh, the more and more we add robots, the more and more we add data points. And now instead of having static data points about one singular operation at one point in time, we're creating dynamic fluid data, data sets that are capturing information about the operation in real time. You're getting holistic perspective, the opportunity, I should say, to create holistic perspective about the end-to-end -end flow of everything in your warehouse. Um, are we to the point of optimizing the use of that opportunity? I think we're light years from that, but I think there's a lot of uh, effort being put in actualizing that vision. Anyone else yeah. want to speak to that? Yeah, this is Andy. Uh, I can jump in. So, you know, John hit on it exactly. That's one of the challenges that we face is Geodis, you know, we look to implement different types of robotics. Um, you know, we have different types and different facilities, but as we start to look at putting different types in the same facilities where there's a handoff of product uh, from one workflow to another, which could be from, you know, one type of, of robot to another and probably two different vendors, how does that communication takes place? Um, right now, it, you know, it goes goes through the WCS, back to the WMS, and then maybe back down. Um, so there's a lag there, and just the complexity of figuring that out uh, is a challenge, I think, that the industry uh, is looking at, and, and some people are trying to solve it. But, you know, John said, light years away. Uh, I feel like we are. I hope I hope we're closer than that because it's going to make some things a lot easier. But, uh, yeah, that's, that's one of the challenges that we, that we face is, as um, – we look to implement different types of technology in the same space. Very good. Thank you. Um, let me turn now to Andy a moment. Um, in your role overseeing innovation for a 3PL, I can imagine that you've been through a great shift. Was your decision to deploy autonomous mobile robots in your facility last year informed by risk management? And at the time, of course, there was not a pandemic or, an, or, or a natural disaster. Uh, like we maybe have now, but was there was there that kind of um, black swan event on your screen that that you that made you want to go to this, or how has automation and uh, AI played into the resilience of your operations in recent months? Was it something you factored in at the time, or just happened to be available now for you? Yeah, so I'll, I'll answer in three parts. So first, starting with you know what was our decision. Um, or how was our decision informed? Uh, was it risk management? We actually started our journey with autonomous mobile robots uh, in 2017. Um, we knew that this, you know, this wave was coming. It certainly wasn't what it is today. You know, even, um, you know, John gave about an eight-year horizon, even in a three-year horizon, it's come so far from where it was. But uh, we wanted to innovate. First and foremost, we wanted to get some new technology into our operations. We wanted to try this out and see how it would benefit us uh, ultimately so that we could be more productive for our customers. Uh, multiple times already it's been mentioned just the speed of fulfilling an order. Uh, as a consumer uh, or somebody that's shopping online, I can place an order very quickly. Uh, transportation providers are getting a lot better about how they deliver that to, you know, from, from the facility to the customer 
how do we process that order faster through the four walls of the facility? Um, labor shortage is something that's also been mentioned. Uh, labor shortage at, at the time was very, you know, the reason for the shortage was different in 2017 than it is now, but it was still a factor. Um, you know, we were facing that. We're, all of our facilities, for the most part, are in logistics parks where all the other major players are. So we're competing for the same labor. Uh, so we wanted to find a way that would allow us to be a little bit less reliant on that labor. And that the labor that was in the warehouse, we made their jobs more enjoyable by working with autonomous mobile robots. Um, and then adaptability, you know, the point, the point of the web, webinar. Um, things change very quickly, as we've seen. So we wanted to be more uh, flexible, or another way to say it would be more elastic in our solution. So as things change, um, and if we you know, using AMRs, different types of robotics, we're able to adapt or expand or contract to that change a lot faster than we would if we had um, more traditional thoughts of automation or mechanization. So we can go get additional robots. We can, you know, size down the number of robots that we need based on the, the throughput capacity that we need. Um, Going to the second part of the question, was the global pandemic or natural disaster uh, on our minds? Um, I got to say that a global pandemic, I don't think, entered into the conversation at the time. Um, but I, now that it has, we're very glad that we have it. Um, you know, John and Ash have, and, and David have both mentioned the, the feedback loop that's coming back from customers on autonomous mobile robots. You know. For me, our, our, my internal customer is our operations team. And I've seen since February and March of this year where our ops teams are coming to me, I mean, daily asking, here's, here's a workflow that I've got in my facility. I see it as non-value add. What options are there out there where I could automate this movement? Um, John, I thought you said it really well. Instead of moving product, let's get them touching product. You know, there's a lot of dunnage that comes out of facilities, cardboard, plastic, trash, and there's people that are moving that around our facilities now. Well, how do we aut automate that? Let's take those people who are pit trained, uh, well-paid operators and get them touching product to help move it through the building uh, instead of doing more non-value added task. Um, the third part, how has it played into the resilience of our operation? Um, you know, with, with innovation and adding, adding AMRs, we know what our capacity is, what it can be. If we need to expand that, it's very easy to add robots or add capacity to what we need based on our customer's need. Um, the other part, which I mentioned earlier, is that it hopefully makes the job more enjoyable for, for our teammates. So instead of using a, a cart and a, having an RF device on their wrist and, and moving that around and doing a lot of walking. Um, now we have robots that are doing the, the traveling for them. Uh, they're walking freely. They're spending their time touching products. So it's a lot less labor intensive for them. Uh, and so the hope is that by making the job more enjoyable, um, they're coming to work more. It's, you know, it's a reliable workforce and we're able to to service the needs of our customers uh, in a much better way. Very good, thank you, Andy. Um, having done that implementation and then all of a sudden right behind the implementation, you had a good use case for it in the fact that the, the pandemic hit, it was a good uh, opportunity to, to realize the value of it. Do you have any good lessons learned from having walked through that that you might be able to share with our audience? Um, you know, I think, the biggest lesson learned, and I mentioned, is just after you know after implementation and seeing the elasticity or flexibility that that solution gives you, you know, just kind of prove proved out to our operations teams uh, and to us, you know, the team that's implementing it. So, um, you know, it was just a really a really good success story for us that um, nobody was expecting peak in April of this year. But when it happened, we were able to turn to our providers and say, um, our, our customers forecast are rapidly changing. We're gonna see, in some cases, higher than peak volumes in a matter of weeks. 
what can we do or how can we partner with you uh, to get more technology in the building? I like what John said. Uh, how can we tech up our operations to be able to meet the demand? And of course, we're entering another peak season now, the, the usual peak season. Are you prepared to handle that with what you've already gone through? Yeah, I'd say we're just continuing the peak season. So we, <laughs> some of our operations haven't gotten out of it yet, and it just it just continues. So, uh, yeah, you know, we're prepared. We start planning for peak. Um, you know, one thing, thankfully, we actually start planning for peak uh, in Q1. So we had some of those preparation conversations already ongoing. Um, so it just got accelerated. You know, we're ready, and uh, this is going to be a peak unlike anything we've ever seen, um, but we're ready for it and, and we know that we're gonna service our customers well. Right, and then now you have the right tools to be able to do that. Exactly. Um, David and John, I'm sorry, please. I was um, just saying David exactly and... right. Thank you. Um, and turning to David and John now, of course you work directly in the robotics area. So do you see this, the, the, the ability for robots to be able to shift in these changing times as being an advantage? What have your customers experienced? Yeah, I mean, certainly that, that, that is one of the core benefits that our customers have identified. You know, we've got, we, we, we can offer that, that, that type of flexibility in terms of, um, you know, taking on a wide, a reasonably wide range of tasks in an individual operation. So, as uh, certain areas get busier or, or uh, you know, equally if, if our customers want to flex manual labor into certain parts of the business and pass off other tasks to us, um, that, that flexibility is something uh, that I think has made automation um, more attractive to end users in this time. Um, Ash mentioned earlier some, um, some, some, some kind of new innovations that, that, that many companies have been offering in this time, things like um, fully remote deployments, which are other areas that we've that we've we've been able to stand up uh, with um, travel limitations in place. So, um, you know, expanding the number of units in site, expanding the number of applications, and standing up new sites. Um, you know, they're all requests that we've had over over recent months as companies are trying to adapt to uh, you know these these um, uh, strain conditions, which you know, as Andy just mentioned, are are not dying down because we've 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 had our our. Um, unexpected peak leading into expected peak, and um, God knows what it'll be in January too. Very good, John. Anything to add? Yeah, real, uh, I'll be brief here, but I think when you're looking at um, you know disaster avoid disaster scenarios or disruption scenarios, you want to look at um, you know you how can you avoid a disruption. How can you respond to a disruption? Then how can you mitigate the risk of that disruption in the in near term and in the long term? And that mitigation strategy should turn into your avoidance strategy, right? And so, you know, how does robotics enable this? Well, again, we, we've talked to, at length today around the impact of labor in the warehouse, right? If you can get more done with with less bodies, but create more efficient and effective operations, you, rec you, you essentially reduce certain degree of risk, right? Because we as humans are a high degree of risk. You know, the devices aren't going to call out sick. Uh, the devices aren't going to take breaks throughout the day. Um, you know, but there's also technology risk, right? You're, we talked about this as uh, connected endpoints, right? Do you have a, di uh, a network security disaster risk mitigation strategy in place? Because now you have all of these assets running around that are talking to each other and in some form or another talking to the internet and creating a, uh, a risk from that front. So, no, I, I see customers really being uh, starting to be very holistic about how they approach this technology in a way that allows them to address their operational requirements today and plan for uh, you know strategizing and how they leverage this technology in new other areas, uh, you know, disaster response and and avoidance uh, being one of those areas. Very good, thank you. We want to remind you that we will be taking questions in just a few moments. So now is the time to get your questions into us. If you haven't already typed them into the chat box, or I'm sorry, to the question box on your screen, make sure you get those into us, and we'll get to as many of them as we can. Um, it's always hard to know on how to prepare for the unknown. And Ash, um, people often look to analysts like yourself to predict the future, but of course this pandemic has been a great reminder that we can't, in fact, know what's coming next. With that in mind, 
What are some of the ways that folks can prepare for the unknown? What should they be considering? What questions should they be asking themselves now? And how do they identify the gaps in their preparedness? Ash, can you respond to that? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, well, first of all, I'm sure John will agree with me on this, that market forecasters, we, we tend to pride ourselves on being able to predict the future accurately. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty certain that no, no one predicted this, this scenario that we're in today. You know, it's, it's um, unprecedented as, as it's been like the, the word has been overused so much. Um, and we talked earlier about, well, what if this happened 10 years ago? But on, on the flip side, a lot has changed in the, ten, in the last 10 years in terms of the global economy and global supply chains. Industries are much more connected, interconnected. All these supply chains are really interconnected globally. And small changes in one country can make huge impacts on the other side of the world. So it is becoming increasingly difficult to prepare for changes when many of these changes might be you know in, in on the other side of the world so I mean, how do you prepare for the unknown i mean really you can't can you but you can try to mitigate the risk as much as possible uh you know eliminating your single point of failure thinking about where the weakest parts are in, in your operations and in, in your supply chain thinking about where you lack redundancy uh, if you're an organization considering automation within your supply chain, don't just think about where you can remove label, where you can save costs. Think about weaknesses in your operations. Think about what, what you might need to scale up or scale down quickly. Um, you know, embrace the change to try and be flexible. And, you know, you've, you've got to ensure that you've got access to good information, good, accurate information, whether that's in-house about your own operational or externally about what's happening in the, in the wider industry. Thank you, Ash. Uh, let me turn now to David Clear um, with Vector Robotics. Uh, what are your customers looking at and how are they, what are they wanting to know to prepare for the future? What kind of things are they considering and questions that they're asking right now? Yeah, I think you know, as they as 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 a lot of our customers are looking at their kind of longer term automation strategy, you know, what we've seen in recent years is um validation of individual um point solutions and um where they're looking where where, where most of the end users are now looking in looking to the future where they gain that benefit is that 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 that, that interoperability between these multiple systems and interoperability between automation and manual solutions. And the um having systems in place that can manage the, the the interaction between not just kind of say navigating in the same space as we often see, but the handoffs and exception handling and equally being able to flex, be it more units in or more people in, just to be in a position to adapt to change. So the more flexible automation that is available uh, um, uh, today versus say, you know, more historic automation, which was, uh, you know, very, very fixed infrastructure, and uh, the, the the flexibility allows uh, customers to build in that that the, those adaptive capabilities that we were that we were discussing earlier, both for you know the forecasted things like just natural growth, seasonal peaks, but also um, events like this. So as I said, no one could have predicted that there was going to be a pandemic in you know February, March, April of of of, of 2020, but. I think many people, in terms of their planning, would be forecasting at some point over that period of time, and um, or or over you know 2020, 2025, there's going to be some large event that would have a knock-on impact on 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 um, on on day-to-day -day operations. So um, having um, having that flexibility to be able to adjust your, your your operations as quickly as possible and leverage that combination of your your human workforce and um, and automation tools uh, is really at the core of any of the strategies that our customers are looking at, and essentially what we're what we're also looking to provide. Alan, what's your take on that? What are your customers looking for, and what kind of questions should they be asking if they're not? Um, I, I'm afraid if I tell them what questions to ask, they may ask, and I don't have the answer. But um, uh, no, in, in reality, our customers are asking uh, and have been uh, all summer this year, especially. Um, how are how are we mitigating our risk? Um, the, the real things we are looking at uh, are how do we 
uh, how do we, based on the individual areas within the facility or the individual uh, work streams within the facility, how are we mitigating the risk in each one of those without adding either risk or putting uh, another work stream at risk uh, in another area of the facility? So it goes back to uh, you know how, how these things are complex. They all interrelate and they they act upon one another. So the the questions that that they're asking us are how are we making sure we, and they're asking about very specific things which is helpful for us because it, it helps us think about those things as well um but uh in general they are all wanting to take advantage of the fact that the consumer is now changing their their uh buying patterns um or at least overall buying patterns are changing and they want to know how we are going to help them adapt to that. Um, I can tell you there's not a week that goes by that I don't hear from one of our clients uh, asking us what we're doing to stay kind of uh, in, 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 at least in front of the technology or, or helping, uh, helping incorporate technology and innovation into our operations. The question used to be because they thought it was cool now it's become a necessity so that we can mitigate our risk uh, in the event that things like this happen in the future. Very good. Thank you. It's time for us to move on quickly to our Q&A session, and we just have a few minutes for these questions. If you, we don't have time to get to your question, uh, we'll try and have somebody get back to you with an answer. But our first question is coming in um, from a listener who's saying that uh, this person is noticing a tight labor market as it relates to engineers, which is very true. Given robotics is ahead of technology when compared to other industries, this person is saying they can only assume that finding engineering talents in robotics and automation is harder. Do you notice that finding talents uh, is uh, hindering the ability for companies to meet demand, and how is that being addressed? Let me ask David with that uh, question about uh, finding engineers to be able to handle all this automation. Yeah, I mean, there's certainly kind of massive growth in the industry as a whole. You're seeing more companies enter the market as more companies, you know, like 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 Jodas are are, are looking to invest in the space, and so surprisingly enough, that that, that attracts um, uh, companies who want to uh, want to join that. And so there is a re there is a relatively tight labor pool in that sense. And we're uh, we're we're in a in a in a in a good enough position in the sense that. Vecna Robotics. Well, Vecna Robotics spun out of Vecna Technologies, so we we, um, we have been operating in this space for nearly twenty years. Um, so we have uh, you know a lot of uh, a lot of experience, both in terms of the team that are here, but also uh, you know given the position we have in the market, we we've we, we've also you know found ourselves to be attractive to that labor pool, which uh, you know is certainly um, certainly as we've seen growth over this year. Uh, you know, we've probably added about 50% uh, additional engineers to our team um, in the in this calendar year. Um, you know, and that 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 kind of that that puts us in a good solid position moving forward. But yeah, I think the market is going to continue to attract more and more engineers to this space, um, and then companies like ourselves will have to compete for it. Very good, thank you. Our next question is on Latin America and whether or not it's able to step up to the automation game. Uh, this uh, listener is asking specifically within the WMS systems. Um, there is a feeling that they're behind and don't know how they'll be able to keep up with it. So uh, I, I think at this point we should probably address it to John with uh, Curver Supply Chain and your work with WMS. Uh, sure. I, I think one thing when, when you think about, um, you know, different markets is different markets have different cost structures. Different cost structures require different solutions, right? Because your return on investment in one region is not going to be the same in another region on the same piece of technology. Uh, a, a good example, I, I had the opportunity uh, a couple of years ago to give a talk in India, and I was talking about robots, and I, I'm not even thinking about it. A big part of the talk was on labor arbitrage. And on stage, I, I made, had the realization, you know, this probably isn't the right, you know, value driver for this particular market, the labor market, there's, there's a lot of available labor. Um, but let's look at the other areas. Uh, Latin America is, you know, obviously made up of many different countries. So each country does have its own dynamic uh, scenarios. 
Um, but some of the bigger ones, Brazil, as an example, has uh, you know isn't as constrained of a labor market. So I think Alan, you called out called it out earlier, the ability to you know put bring people in to solve the problem from a flexibility perspective. Uh, that exists in in that particular market. So the constraints aren't the same. That said, uh, we actually acquired a company last year that's now a part of Kerber Supply Chain in Latin America that focuses on WMS, WCS, and automation deployments. It's it's a growing market. It's certainly behind, but it's in terms of the level of adoption. But that's a function of the the dynamics of the market itself, the constraints that that have existed and the cost structures. Um, certainly, things will continue to adapt in that market. We are seeing Central American countries I- investing significantly in robotics, and I think that's it's going to continue to flow down based on industry requirements. Very good, thank you. We have time for just probably one more question, and this has come in. That a, uh, a facility is about 150,000 square foot, so not a large facility. What advice do you have for this person as they look to their 2021 initiatives and spend? Um, does robotics, the fact that it's able to scale, help smaller facilities as well as the really large ones? Uh, anyone who would like to take that? Maybe David? Yeah, I'll, I'll take it. Yeah, I mean, I think we, what we've seen is, you know, there are certain sites, obviously, that kind of are more uh, more suited than others. But in the majority of sites we've been in, and you know, we have, we have units deployed within sites, I think, that are sub-100,000 square feet. And so there are, you know, it obviously will depend on the workflows and where the opportunities are. But I think having automation um, and to a degree, cool, you know, topics around the orchestration and the execution as part of um, as part of your um, your automation strategy, um, I think will be will be uh, very helpful. Um, there are efficiencies to be gained in terms of, uh, you know, just smart decision making, smart task allocation, be it to uh, manual operators or automation and just kind of finding that right mix of applications uh, you know is an area that we see time and time again is something that drives value for for uh, end users thank you unfortunately we are at a time if we didn't get a chance to, to address your question we'll try to have somebody get back in touch with you uh, thanks for those who did submit questions and um, we're sorry we can't get to all of them we do have on the screen right now some contact information if you'd like more information on the, the companies represented by the panelists today, Vecna Robotics, Geodis, Kerber Supply Chain, Interact Analysis, please feel free to go to their websites and get additional information on their solutions and their um, and also as well as case histories and other things that you'll find there at their websites. Lots of good information available there. Um, shortly after this live event, we'll send you an email reminder so that you can access the presentation on demand. You can view it again or you could encourage you to share it with a colleague of yours. Thanks again to all of our presenters for a very informative session and for Vecna Robotics for their sponsorship of today's webinar. Um, and we also thank you for sharing your time with us today, those of you who participated and listened. We know your time is valuable, and we hope that you walked away with some good ideas to help you to better manage your own supply chains. For all of us at DC Velocity, I'm David Maloney. Thanks for joining us, and have a great day.